What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. Okay, so as promised, we get into the origin of X-23, and I feel like maybe I've done this before, but I think it's like one of my older style videos where they were like super boring and scripted. Those videos suck. Instead, we are going to do this fun. So, uh, X-23's origin story is rooted in like the cartoon show, really, X-Men Evolution. I mean, she first popped up there. Craig Kyle and Chris Yoss made her. Everybody loved her, and so Marvel was like, well, let's throw her in the comics. Now, she did appear in NYX, and I feel like NYX was part of Marvel's Max line of comics. At least I certainly hope it was because X-23, the way she appeared in that story, was anything but a character designed for kids. But with regards to Innocence Lost, this is like her first in the main Marvel continuity story. And really, if you wanted to pick up with X-23, this would be the place to go. I mean, you could read X-23 volumes one and two, probably X-Force, and then just kind of go from there. Uh, really, all new, all different Wolverine is a great place to start. But the idea here is this will essentially give us everything that we need with regards to this story. Now, what this does is this picks up with regards to uh, the escape of, of Wolverine. Remember, we talked about that in our video on the origin of uh, Wolverine's adamantium. Again, you'll find that down in the description. But we had talked about how when Wolverine was taken into the Weapon X program, he was uh, basically had adamantium bonded to his skeleton. He was trained to be a killer. Eventually, he escaped. Well, what this does is show us the multifaceted elements of his escape in the sense that it wasn't just him breaking out of the facility, killing a handful of professors, and then just riding off into the sunset. Well, it wasn't really the sunset. It was kind of in the snow and, you know, it was nasty outside. <laughs> but it was it was basically him just kind of getting away from this a horrendous experience he was having. What we also do is we pick up with a guy by the name of Dr. Rice. Now, uh, this guy is essentially one of the multitude of people who were killed by Wolverine. But the issue here is that at this point, Wolverine's still very animalistic in terms of how he functions and in terms of how he operates. And so because of that, by killing this guy, Dr. Rice, Wolverine just basically takes off and leaves everything there. But what this does is this sets the stage for a man by the name of Martin Sutter to essentially go back home to Dr. Rice's family, meet with his son Xander, provide him with the dog tags of his father, say, I'm sorry, the worst thing you feared has happened, and basically take him on as his own. Now, several years later, and we're kind of left to believe this is something like 20-some-odd 20 20 -odd years later, we pick up with Xander Rice with a continuation of this Weapon X project. Now, that's where we get into things, because remember, following the escape of Wolverine and the fact that his, his skeleton was bonded with adamantium, he had a healing factor, it was like the great space race, right? I mean, everybody wanted to get their hands on Wolverine or have something like him. That's one of the reasons why he's always been such a popular character, and he really was up until the expansion of the Weapon X project uh, during Grant Morrison's run of the X-Men. That's why Wolverine was so popular, because he was an anomaly. He was like the one guy that had adamantium claws, the one guy that had an adamantium skeleton. He had a healing factor. He was, for all intents and purposes, indestructible. And so because of this, with Wolverine having the abilities that he does, people were trying to form their own Weapon X programs. Now, some individuals did this, or some companies did this, and even some countries did this for the purpose of just having their own version of Wolverine. With regards to what's going on here with Martin Sutter and Xander Rice, they're doing this for profit. And that's kind of the ironic thing about all this is because they're, they're basically doing it for money. Now with Xander Rice undergoing this most recent experiment to basically try to clone Wolverine, ultimately it's not working. And that's really the inherent difference here. When it comes to these different variations of, uh, of trying to duplicate Wolverine, the example of like Deadpool, for instance, it was the idea of bonding Wolverine's uh, healing factor to other people or trying to bond adamantium. And ultimately it just didn't really work the way it was supposed to. With what Martin Sutter and Xander Rice are doing here, they're like, we don't need to bond adamantium to people. We just need to clone Wolverine. If we can clone him, make a perfect clone, then what that means is we can literally use this clone to do what Weapon X was originally supposed to do. And this makes sense because remember, the Weapon X project was in the 1960s. This is, you know, 40 years later or 20 years later, whatever, it's 1980s, 1990s. The result is that technology is more advanced now than it was back then. And so because of this, there's a lot more stuff that they can do. They can bring in psychics to mess with the mind of the Wolverine clone, make him do what they wanted to do. There's a lot of different things that they can, uh, they can engineer here in order to make sure that this Wolverine clone is docile. The problem with this is that every time they try to clone him, it just doesn't work. Now, in terms of why it's not working is revealed to us with the introduction of a character by the name of Sarah Kenny. Now, Sarah Kenny is much like Maura McTaggart in Marvel Comics. That is to say, where Maura McTaggart is one of like the, the leading geneticists when it comes to the idea of, uh, of mutants within the Marvel Comics community, this character, Sarah Kenny, is very much the same way, just with a more updated version, with a more updated version of her character in the sense that her speciality is biology and cloning. And 
And so the idea is if Xander Rice can't get it right, then maybe Sarah Kenny can. Now, of course, this creates a rift between the two of them in the sense that Xander Rice looks at Sarah Kenny as a person that's trying to take over his role, right? I mean, like, like he was, he's basically the protege. He's like the, the adopted son of Martin Sutter. And then suddenly this woman, Sarah Kenny comes in and she's going to be the one heading the program now. Now, of course, with regards to Sarah Kenny analyzing these things, what we end up finding out here is that the, the genes themselves are, are basically screwed up. The genes themselves are not what they're supposed to be. And so it's like trying to make a cake with only half the ingredients. You just can't do it. And so because of that, Sarah Kinney says, we only really have one option. The only option that we have here is to basically replace, you know, replace the, uh, the Y gene with an X gene, basically turning what would be a man into a woman. Now, something else that I want to draw your attention to is the idea that Xander Rice is basically sleeping with the wife of Martin Sutter. Now, that's not wildly important right now, but it will be important later on down the line. But of course, when Sarah goes to Martin Sutter and says, hey, look, this is the only option that we have. We have to create a clone of Wolverine with the XX gene instead of an XY gene, making him a woman instead of a man. Xander Rice freaks. He's like, no, it's supposed to be Wolverine. It has to be Logan. And the reason for this isn't just because of the fact that he's trying to assert his dominance. The idea is to basically be duplicitous, to trick people. Because remember, if there's a Logan running around out there right now, and then suddenly somebody says, hey, I just saw Wolverine assassinate the prime minister of some country somewhere. Well, then people are going to say, well, what's we do we really have two Wolverines in the same, you know, two Wolverines running around the world? It creates a really confusing situation for everybody. But the idea here is also that in the end, Sarah Kenny doesn't care. She says, look, I'm here to do a job and I'm going to do that job to the best of my ability, even if it means going against everything that I've been told so far. And so what happens is Sarah Kinney ends up going to Martin Sutter and saying, hey, look, I did my job. All right, I made this clone of Wolverine. I violated your orders not to make it a female. I went ahead and made it a female anyway. We now have a girl clone of Wolverine in the works. Now, of course, where Xander freaks, Martin Sutter's just like, hey, we have a job to do. And so he tells her, go through with it. Find a surrogate mother for this, this clone that you're making. Well, then, of course, we have Xander Rice going to Sarah Kinney and it's like, guess what? You're going to be the surrogate mother. Now, again, this is part of that whole, you know, that whole rift between the two of them in the sense that Xander Rice is basically going to make Sarah Kinney carry this girl to term. Now, it's not like Xander Rice walks in and says, you're the surrogate mother and leaves. What he does is he more or less blackmails her. He says, look, you're effectively engineering a child from scratch. You're playing God. You know, now what you can do is either you can carry this child to term or I can kill it. But whichever one you pick, it's going to be on your head. Now, of course, this is him screwing with her head. But at the end of the day, Sarah Kinney says, OK, and she basically allows herself to be impregnated with Laura Kinney with X-23. Now, at this point going forward, things get really, really dark. And the reason why, well, not super dark, but things get really screwed up for Laura Kinney. The reason why is because she was created to be a killer. At this point, it's out of Sarah Kinney's hands. Her job is done. She was the one that was there to be the biological engineer behind X-23. You know, Sarah's just kind of kept on board because, you know, it works. And so the idea here is almost immediately after she's born, going, you know, seven years later on, she's just basically trained nonstop in martial arts. She's trained on how to be an assassin. Now, this is why I say that when people make that argument of X-23 versus Wolverine, things get interesting. Things get kind of intriguing. And the reason why is because of the fact that in some ways, X-23 is better than Wolverine. In other ways, Wolverine's better than X-23. X-23 does not have the experience that Logan has. She just hasn't been around long enough. She didn't have the experience that Logan had when he was part of Team X. She didn't have the experience he had when he escaped from the facility, joined the X-Men, went on to become part of the Avengers. She doesn't have any of that. Instead, all she has is the seven years of training. But it's seven years of some of the most advanced and some of the most honed military training and, uh, and, and martial arts training that a person can receive. She is essentially the perfect weapon. Now, the crazy thing about all this is that this situation also has Xander Rice basically making life hell for, for Laura Kinney. And the reason why is because of the fact that Sarah is very nurturing with regards to her daughter. She teaches her. She reads to her. She basically tries to help restore her humanity because that's the whole thing is X-23's humanity has essentially been stripped away. That's really this whole idea. In addition to that, it's other people like her sensei, her martial arts master, trying to reconnect with her humanity, trying to keep what's left of her humanity alive. The fact that Laura Kinney hasn't really been human in the sense that she hasn't received external stimulus, she hasn't developed friends, she hasn't developed relationships, things like that, is something that could, you know, inevitably work on behalf of Xander Rice if his mission comes to fruition. But by way of uh, the sensei and Sarah trying to focus on the humanity of X-23 in order to basically keep her around, what it does is it allows her to basically kind of walk this fine edge between becoming an animal that doesn't do anything but kill and trying to become some measure of a human being. Now, because of the fact that Xander Rice looks at the death of his father as something that was engineered by Wolverine, remember, Dale Rice, the father of Xander, was the one who was killed by Wolverine. He harbors a hatred for X-23. I mean, she's the 23rd attempt at cloning Wolverine. That's why she's called X-23. But because of the fact that she's here, Xander Rice looks at her as someone that he can basically take his frustrations out on. Now, he doesn't do anything extremely heinous in terms of, you know, violating X-23 or anything like that. But what he does 
does do is he basically forces her to endure all different kinds of torture. The first of this comes in the form of her healing factor. And the reason why is because her healing factor hasn't manifested yet. And that's one of the frustrations that Xander Rice is having is by now her healing factor should be there, but it hasn't. And so the idea is let's jumpstart it. Let's force her body into a situation where her either her healing factor will, will, will manifest, it'll respond or she'll die. So they literally just start blanketing her in radiation. Of course, her healing factor kicks in to preserve her. And that, that really just kind of goes forward into the next stage, which is giving her adamantium. And this is a huge difference between X-23 and, and Wolverine. With Wolverine, his entire body was bonded with adamantium. His entire skeleton was bonded with adamantium. With X-23, it's not that way. It was supposed to get to that point, and we'll find out why it doesn't in this video. But at the moment, her claws are literally pulled out of her body with no anesthesia. She feels all the pain. Xander Rice dips them, or at least he sharpens them, dips them in adamantium, and puts them back in. She's made to feel the full pain of all of this. In addition to this, because of the fact that she's very much like Wolverine, she has a feral state. Now, when it comes to Wolverine entering his feral state, it can be done in a multitude of different ways, but it's very similar to Thor's warrior madness in the sense that Wolverine can just be overcome with emotion, overcome with like anger, rage, something like that. And he'll literally just enter an animalistic state where all measure of higher thinking goes right out the window. And he's basically like a rabid wolf attacking everything he sees. Now, there is some measure of a connection. Those who are extremely close to him are individuals that he won't necessarily attack. He'll simply just run away or something like that. Like a, again, like a, like a feral dog. But with X-23, what has to happen here is basically a trigger scent has to be issued. And that's something I'd like you to keep in the back of your head. But what happens is, uh, is, is Xander Rice basically imbues this trigger scent onto uh, the sword of X-23. And the reason why is that with her sensei basically being one of the individuals that's trying to help restore her humanity during one of their training sessions, X-23 lashes out because of this trigger scent, goes into an animalistic state and kills her sensei. Now, again, one of the things that's established here by Craig Kyle and Chris Yoss is that much like Wolverine, when she goes into this animalistic state, when this trigger sense activated, she doesn't necessarily remember everything that goes on. But again, we jump forward by about three years when we're basically left to believe that Sarah Kinney's still around here. She's still an important part, but she's really the last bastion for X-23 maintaining her humanity. Everybody else is gone. The sensei has gone. It's just the entire facility and then Sarah Kinney. And so because of this, Laura has been receiving a multitude of, uh, of assignments. So this is to say individuals she's supposed to assassinate and she's given a watch for the time. That is to say it's, it's supposed to be like 22 minutes between the time she receives this, the time that she goes out, the time that person dies and the time she gets back. Now, keeping her on a short leash is extremely effective. And the reason why is because waste not, want not. When it comes to the character of X-23, one of the first assassinations that she gets is a guy named Greg Johnson running for president. She gets in there, she poses as a handicapped child just by virtue of the fact that it would create good press. The, uh, the campaign manager of Greg Johnson says, bring that girl in here, you know, let's parade her out in front of everybody. We can take pictures, so on and so forth, make our candidate look good. That's just the opportunity X-23 needs. In the span of three or four seconds, she kills not only presidential candidate Greg Johnson, but his entire family, his entire, you know, everybody that's with him, his entire uh, campaign staff, the secret service agents that are there to protect him, everyone that's in this room dies. And this all happens over the span of about 22 minutes between the time she got the mission and the time that she got back. Now, this was really just designed to be an advertisement. It's really all Martin Sutter and Xander, uh, Xander Rice were doing is they were saying, hey, look, to everybody who's, who's listening to as part of this thing, you know, whether it be somebody like Red Skull, whether it be, you know, Dr. Doom, whether it be Kingpin, it doesn't matter. He, they're basically saying, hey, look, what I offer you is a contract killer. She's owned by us. You can rent her out. You can pay for her services. You'll pay us $6 million, $10 million, whatever it is that you want, but she'll kill anyone anywhere, no matter where they happen to be. It does not matter. Now, the crazy thing about this is Sarah continues to try to tap into the humanity of X-23, but in the end, it doesn't really seem to matter. She shows no external stimulus. She shows nothing to indicate that she values Sarah Kinney, that she sees her as, a, as like a mother, that she sees her as a friend. All she does is take the mission, and these missions take her everywhere. She kills uh, She kills royalty, she kills kings and queens, she kills godfathers, you know, she kills uh, drug lords. I mean, she kills anyone and everyone and she even goes against the hand. Now, the reason why Craig Kyle and Chris Yoss included the hand in here was to prove a point. Within the realm of Marvel Comics, the hand, and of course, if you're watching the Daredevil Netflix series, you'll be familiar with them, but the hand is a, a mystical group of ninjas based out of Japan. But they're basically uh, almost believed to be unstoppable. If the hand come for you, then you better get your affairs in order. <laughs> that's it. You know, if, if if the hand are coming for you, then then that's it. Then you're done. You're, you're basically over with. They're so good at what they do. X-23 is 
better. And it's just pointing out the idea that she can take on a contingent of the hand and hold her own perfectly well. What we also find out is with regards to Xander Rice sleeping with the wife of Martin Sutter, she becomes pregnant. Now, again, this shows us the darker side of Xander and the sense that he's not just angry at uh, X-23, he's angry at the world. He's one of these guys that has some anger over something and just can't let it go. One of these toxic human beings. And so because of this, when Martin Sutter's wife goes to Xander and says, look, I'm pregnant, he says, then tell Martin it's his child. Do not come to me with that. Do not come to me with your problems. I don't care if I father that child. It's not mine. Now, at this point, we end up picking up with Xander with regards to one of the missions of X-23. And what he does is he basically leaves her behind. That's the worst thing about this. When he sends her on the mission, she's successful in completing it. She does exactly what she's supposed to do. But Xander Rice tells the pilot, leave. He kills everybody on board, basically eliminating all the witnesses and leaves X-23 behind, essentially saying, I don't know what happened to her. As far as I know, she died. And that's really it. But in the, in the end, he's basically getting his revenge on Wolverine by way of X-23. Now, of course, the cool thing about this is that it doesn't work. And the reason why is because when he gets back to the facility, he tells Martin Sutter, well, you know, I mean, she died, but I mean, we can just recreate her. We can just make a new one, you know, but then ultimately she shows up. She comes back. She literally infiltrates the facility and she comes back. Now, of course, the question that's being asked here is what in the heck happened? I thought you said she died, but she's just kind of like, you know, nobody, nobody knows what, how to respond here. Nobody knows what to say. But what we also get is this small little instance of humanity in her. It's a little, it's visceral, you know, it's, it, it really kind of yanks at the heartstrings. But what, what's, uh, what Laura Kinney's been doing, what X-23 has been doing is whenever she commits her assassinations, she, she, cuts herself. She puts X's on her arms. Now, the reason for why she does this in particular is not revealed in this story. Instead, this is just Craig Kyle and Chris Yaw saying, see, there's some measure of humanity there. There is some measure of humanity in this little girl. And Sarah Kinney seems to have been the only one that kept this candle going. Now, at this point, we basically pick up with Sarah grabbing X-23 for her own purposes. And the reason why is because uh, Sarah Kinney's sister calls and says, hey, look, my, my daughter's gone. I have no idea what happened. And so what Sarah does here is basically use X-23 for her own reasons. Now, the irony about all this is Sarah Kinney basically said, look, what Martin Sutter, what Xander Rice, those guys are doing, that's wrong. They should not be using you for their own purposes. But then she turns around and does the same thing. The difference here is the motivation. It's the idea of consequence versus intention. You know, if you have to take a moral stance, which one do you take? Do you focus on the idea that your intention is to bring harm to another? Or do you focus on the idea that your action is good, but it unintentionally brings harm to another person? In the end, it's really just this idea that Sarah Kinney is doing doing the right thing uh, for the right reasons. I mean, she literally takes X-23. She basically gives her the scent of, uh, of of her niece. And then X-23 just starts tracking the little girl down to the home of a guy. Now, of course, when X-23 gets there, she just pretends to be a little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. And this is when we find out this guy isn't necessarily vi violating these young girls, but he is murdering them. He's actually been killing about seven different girls over the, over the span of, of some measure of time. I don't think we're given a window. But uh, when, when X-23 gets in there, you know, she's like, hey, would you like to buy some Girl Scout cookies? Now, I love this little segment. And the reason why is because she opens the box and it's a picture of the girl that this guy kidnapped. And he's like, what the hell is going on? X-23 throws him out a window. Now, if it were me, I wouldn't have been so light. I would have, I probably would have tortured that guy for two weeks and I would have given him a blood transfusion if I had to. But X-23 decides to give this guy the quick way out, throws him out of a window, guy falls to his death and the niece of Sarah is rescued. Now, following this, all hell breaks loose. And the reason why is because of the fact that Martin Sutter's ready to go. I mean, he's done. He's like, look, I've been part of this racket for, for years and years and years, I'm ready to retire. I'm ready to call it a day. He basically leaves everything behind to Xander Rice. Xander Rice goes back to his car. When X-23 is brought back to the facility, Xander Rice goes back to his car and says, your contract is 22 minutes long and your targets are are Martin Sutter, his wife, and his son. Now, the reason why this is being done is because of the fact that the wife of Martin Sutter could bring everything down, you know, crashing down for uh, for Xander Rice. So she went to Martin and said, look, you know, your child, the child that I told you is yours, Henry, is not yours. You know, you've believed he's yours for the last three years, but he's actually Xander's. It could create all kinds of different problems to say nothing of the governmental contacts that Martin Sutter's built over the years that could easily see uh, Xander Rice snuffed out with no one having any idea whatever happened to him. And so because of this, X-23 basically carries out her mission with almost perfection. What she does is she goes in, she kills Martin Sutter, she kills Martin Sutter's wife, but she spares the son, Henry. Again, another hint at this humanity inside of X-23. And that's what I love about this is because when you look at her character for what she does by way of her actions, she's it's like, it's like Laura Kinney as a character is on the inside screaming to get out, but she can't. She can't vocalize her thoughts. She can't vocalize her emotions. She can't tell people how she's feeling. All she can do is just show things through physical action. And so after the mission's over, she's taken 
taken back to her containment room. She's told by, by Xander Rice, you don't tell anybody about this. You tell no one what happened. Everybody's going to believe that Martin Sutter and his family died in a fire, just like I told you to make it look like, and that will be, that'll be it. But when Sarah goes into the room of Laura, she finds her cutting herself. Again, another sign that she's committed another assassination. And we end up finding out by way of Laura Kinney, when she basically opens her mouth and reveals a piece of paper that she was sent on a mission to kill Martin Sutter, to kill Martin Sutter's wife and Martin Sutter's son. And so the result of this is Sarah basically says, she ends up going to confront Xander Rice and says, this all stops. Everything here comes to an end. And I love this because it's almost like something that should have happened so long ago, but it's Sarah finally saying, this is done. This is over. We're not playing this game anymore. So what ends up happening is Xander Rice says, fine, if you want out, you can be out. You know, if you want to be done, you can be done. I mean, I'm going to get rid of X-23. She doesn't matter. We've got containment cells filled with people just like her. We've got embryos growing all over the place because we're going to make an army of these assassins and I'm going to make a ton of money off of it. And so, of course, you know, stroking her hair, rubbing her face, more or less intimidating Sarah Kinney. He says, look, you know, you can be part of this or you can be out of this. But if you're out, you're out forever. And so what ends up happening is Sarah Kinney says, OK, this this is about it. She basically just kind of calls it quits, writes a letter to her child, you know, and intends to basically go and uh, and get X-23 out of there. But one of the last things she does is she gives X-23 a contract. Contract. And the contract is for X-23 to kill Xander Rice. Now, this is where the story gets so good. I mean, it's kind of weird. It takes it to about the end before it gets incredible. But with Xander Rice, you know, with, with this whole idea of, uh, of basically trying to run this show on his own, what he's failed to take into account is that at her base core, Laura Kinney's human and she remembers everything, every single thing. One of the first things she does is go into the containment room with all these different vials, all these different, you know, uh, these different fetus that are being created for the purpose of engineering more versions of X-23 and annihilate them all and kills every single guard in there. And what comes after this is a bloodbath. On her way to Xander, uh, Xander Rice, she kills everyone. And I mean everyone. Like anyone she comes across that's part of the facility dies. Scientist military officer, soldier, it doesn't matter. Every last one of them dies. She finally comes across Xander Rice and she basically starts to beat the hell out of him, right? I mean, you know, Zan, like she's able to, to easily topple him because Xander Rice failed to take into account the idea that X-23 has it out. I mean, with every punch, with every hit, with every assault that she makes on him, she flashes back to him calling her an animal, you know, for, for him getting his revenge, leaving her behind. You know, all these, these horrible things that he did to her, she remembers them all. And she's taking out every last one of them with every punch she makes, ultimately leaving him behind with the building exploding. And so once we get around to her escape and her more or less reuniting with her mother, or at least Sarah Kenny having the intention of taking X-23 with her, what we find out is that when Xander Rice was stroking the cheek of Sarah, he was planting a trigger scent. And just like she did with her sensei, X-23 lashes out and kills Sarah Kenny. And it's one of the saddest things to see because it's just like, it's 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 so crushing because she basically tells, she tells Laura, she says, look, you know, you're my child, your name is Laura. This is the first time in the comic that she actually gets a name, but she says, your name is Lore. You're my child. You're not a monster. You are a child. You are not some object to be used by other people. You're a kid. You have to basically live your life. And so what she does is she essentially just kind of bails out. She ends up making her way off. And this basically leads to her introduction as part of the X-Men and so on and so forth, coming across Wolverine for the very first time, which is a uh, which is a really, really cool story in terms of how that unfolds. But yeah, guys, if you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. I mean, this is the origin of X-23. And it's one of my favorite stories with her character. And she really only gets better in her own volume right up until the end. And adventures and babysitting get weird as hell. But um, but anyway, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.